Oh, that's Patty. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Hi. Hello, everyone. Are we all here now, Laura? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. I will continue to let folks in as they arrive, but, okay. but we're ready to go. Thank you, everyone. Welcome yes. to the Chicago Wilderness Cafe. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, as uh, the kind of title, uh, you know, kind of gives you a clue, um, and as I'm sure lots of you have already also experienced uh, this winter, um, it has been a bit of a challenge trying to keep on our toes with the warm weather and the rather unpredictable uh, cold, warm, kind of alternating. Um, and so that's really what we're here to talk about today. And hopefully we'll get a chance for everybody to share kind of their own working strategies and collect that uh, a little bit later. But first, what I wanna do is um, introduce um, our panel. Um, and um, we have, I'm going to get my, my list up here so I can uh, make sure I don't miss anybody. We have Keith Gray with us today from Integrated Lakes Management, Nick Fuller from the Forest Preserve District of DuPage County, Troy Showerman from the Forest Preserves of Cook County, Dave Casson from Lake County Forest Preserve District, uh, I think Scott is, as well, Scott McCormick from Homer Tree Service, and Eric Ness is with the USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. So we have a really broad uh, perspective, um, as you can see from the panelists. And, um, you know, everything from kind of a little bit of wildlife management to tree clearing, et cetera. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because Keith Gray is up first. And um, I think I'm going to share my screen. Hold on a second. Um, the PowerPoint up. There we go. Um, Keith Gray is going to start. Perfect. There we go. See. Um, you should see the winter woody clearing techniques that, that uh, Keith has for us. Is that correct? Yep. Looks good. Okay, perfect. Keith, um, I'll drive. You just tell me when you need a new slide. Okay. Can you, everybody hear? Can you hear me? We good? Yes. Perfect. Okay, good, good. Well, thank you. And Patty, first, thank you. I've made it very clear while um, we're getting queued up here. I'm not a techie and thank you for driving the slideshow. So um, I would, I would mess that up for sure. Um, this slide was not an accident. You know, it's a winter woody clearing um, I'm sharing some information and what we have here is a picture of a bunch of water. Um, our company is is really, it, its founding is in um, lake management, right? So we find ourselves usually in wet circumstances and a lot of the equipment we use, um, we need to use in wet or or even floating situations. So, um, you know, that was kind of on purpose, not, not a mistake that we're talking about winter woody clearing and I'm showing you a lake. That's That's basically where our roots are. And um, and you'll see a little bit of that in the equipment I'll talk about. Um, so next slide, please. And, and kind of, well, it's no secret, um, you know, the FECON brand name of um, a forestry mower on, on the, attached to a skid steer, a high, um, high velocity, high pressure, high hydraulic output skid steer um, seems to work really well for us. We have used other manufacturers of these cutter heads, uh, and they're not nearly as durable, not nearly as um, robust is a good word. Um, these seem to be the standard. And, and for us, they work really well. There is a certain amount of operator familiarity uh, when you're using these things. We've made a lot of mistakes um, to the detriment of some of our equipment, um, gotten some of them stuck, gotten um, some of them tangled up with barbed wire, you know, a lot of that stuff can happen. And, and so some of the experience levels that that's required to be able to do a good job with this, I think can't be understated. Um, next one. Um, yeah, so FECON also makes a cutter head that can be attached to the arm of an excavator. So this is a Bobcat uh, E50 excavator. 
We're using this on uh, floatable pontoons uh, in incredibly wet areas. This machine will actually float. So we are at a bit of an advantage when the ground is very, very soft in that we can go in with a machine like this and have very, very little compaction, if any, um, and, and be very gentle. The disadvantage of this machine is it is incredibly slow incredibly slow. I mean, two miles an hour. So if we have to track from the trailer deep into the woods, you know, that may be a day. I mean, it's, and, and turning, as you might imagine, is is very, very difficult. But, you know, this machine is, is one that we can use in wet or very, very soft areas. All right, next slide. That same machine is um, on a ground-based um, frame. So it's it's the same upper, but with a different lower. You can see that he's in a higher area. Uh, the right behind him is a wet area. In front of him or to the right is a wet area. So we are a bit limited where we might be able to use this machine, um, but it's great for tight areas. Whereas that other machine is, um, if you're going to be trying to get between oak trees or some mature growth, um, that one's going to be tough. If it's from something like this can be used. Was there a question there or no? All right, next one. I know I'm going to track kind of fast here, but I'm, I'm making room for others. Um, tracks are the name of the game, right? So if the, the wider the track, the more the um, uh, contact with the ground, the lower the ground pressure. And, and so this is just an illustration of that. You know, these machines can come in different track widths. Um, we're always trying to use as wide a track as we possibly can. And, and that's all I, I need to say about that. Um, the next slide is is just an illustration of the the smaller diameter targets. Um, you know, different attachments on brush cutters can get through areas um, and even soft areas uh, with with people um, and and not using machines, um, not using tracked machines. So obviously, brush cutters um, configured different ways with different cutting heads gets us where we need to go. Um, Again, if you're in the middle of nowhere and, and equipment goes down, uh, we find that having a whole arsenal of these things ready to roll is pretty valuable. Um, that way we're not trying to fix things in the field or walking back and forth. Can anybody hear me? Heard that. Okay, now. You were yeah. out. Did I lose you? Next slide, please. Actually, if you want to go back um, a minute or two, you did freeze for a second. So, oh, um, okay. Unless that was just for me. Did anybody else for me experience as well. that? It got awfully okay, quiet. You. Yeah. Do you want to go backwards a little bit? There or go back again? That like sounds good. Until the end of the tracks you were talking about. Yeah, okay, then this is fine. So small diameter targets um, are, are appropriate. Uh, or to use the, the brush cutters configured with different cutting heads is appropriate. Um, I guess what's worth saying here is when the ground's very, very soft and and your targets are, you know, inch and a half or, or, or two inches or less, um, this is very, very effective. Um, but if anybody's looking at doing this kind of work and, and wants to be efficient and wants to have a high production rate, um, having more equipment than you have people is is recommended. You know, these break, um, they go down for reasons that only God understands sometimes. Um, and, and again, you just don't want to have your guys out there trying to tinker with small parts and, and troubleshooting. You want them productive. So we tend to go out with way more equipment than we need. Um, just to make sure that we're not losing our, our daylight, um, right? In the winter, everything gets dark at 4.30, so we got to stay moving. This, of course, is the standard. You know, chainsaws, whether you're dropping and burning or dropping and chipping, um, management of what's been cut is challenging, especially when you have buckthorn growing close to each other and the, and the upper branches are intertwined and interlocked. Um, and, and so oftentimes what looks like a simple cut on, you know, a five inch um, DBH tree like this 
might actually be very time consuming if it's grown into the branches of the trees around it. So, um, you know, when we look at jobs and we try to quote them, we're looking at the density and, and whether or not the upper branches are grown together. Because if you can't use a, uh, the skid steer with the fecon and you've got to go in and do it with chainsaws, uh, it, you could be in for the long haul. We've learned that the hard way. The next slide is, um, you know, what happens after you cut it? Um, and, and sometimes we're, we're um, if you have deep snow, this is really a challenge. Um, in, in years like this, where you don't have deep snow and you cut real close to the ground, um, finding those stumps and, and applying your herbicide with the oil and a dye um, obviously is a lot easier. But um, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be, I'm sure I'm talking about things everybody else is going to be touching on. And I believe the last slide, the next one is simply a burn pile. Um, well, two different, uh, it'll be the burn pile as well as the chipper. You know, what do you do with the material once it's down? If you're not chipping it, with a fecon, you're dropping it, you might be dragging it to a burn pile, or the next slide um, is the chipper, um, which is gonna make the, the site look a little different than using a fecon as you may have piles of chips in one location, whereas using the skid steer mounted um, forestry mower, it's spread more evenly around. Um, interesting that um, whether you're chipping and, or feconing, um, the re-sprouts, you know, re-sprouts are going to come up a lot sooner if you don't have a lot of debris. Um, if you've got piles of debris, you may go through, treat your re-sprouts, and then a month later, through some of your thicker piles, your re-sprouts are coming up. So we're trying to pay attention to how we leave the debris and and, and so that when we go back and are addressing re-sprouts, uh, we don't have a, a double duty on our hands. We're trying to get it all at one time. So I hope I didn't go too quick, and I'm happy to answer questions probably at the end. I'll make room for everybody else. Great. Thank you, Keith. Um, our next person up, I'm going to stop sharing the screen because he doesn't have slides, is Nick Fuller uh, with DuPage County. Uh, welcome, Nick. Love to hear what you have to share with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so I think we've all had a pretty big learning curve over the last five years, and then especially this last winter has been particularly crazy. So over this time, uh, our district, uh, we've kind of had some takeaways from this. And I think one of them is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I would say also try to make best use of what the year is giving you. Um, so I'm gonna tell you that this is a process for us. So we started with kind of an ultra conservative approach, you know, 20 to 25, 30 years ago, where we're using hand crews only. And ever since then, we've kind of been incrementally uh, moving to a more aggressive approach with equipment or integrating equipment with people sometimes and uh, always testing and evaluating, kind of checking how these various things work for us. So we want to do things right, but obviously the timeline is tight and the stakes are high. And I think we came to this realization with some of these critical timelines we're facing, you know, climate change, oaks are aging out, ecosystem collapse, the speed of uh, woody invasive species moving in, also their reinvasion in certain areas. And so I believe the intent of the cafe is to kind of focus more on initial clearing, uh, largely, particularly with larger equipment. But if I have enough time at the end of my presentation, I kind of want to get into our preventative maintenance cycle uh, that I believe will also uh, hopefully be helpful for folks. So for winter work, we have our in-house natural resources crew and our grounds crews. They, they obviously do a ton of invasive woody, uh, woody invasive species management for us. And then over the last five years, and I would say even the last two to three years, we've significantly ramped up our contractor capacity, uh, also helping with that. So I've been trying to develop a framework for deploying these various resources for winter habitat. And I kind of came up with in combination with a bunch of other people here an ever changing kind of five variable matrix that we're looking at. And it's basically ground conditions, number one, quality sensitivity of the site, type of equipment, because each type of equipment kind of has its own unique signature for ground disturbance, seasonality, and then also kind of like a seize the day mentality, which I'll kind of get into a little bit later here in a moment. So I'm going to start with number one and number two here. So that's the, again, that's the ground conditions and the quality, the sensitivity of the site. So in our non-remnant areas, so recreated prairies, second growth, if we're converting, say a farm field, something like that, we're pretty flexible in terms of ground conditions. 
We accept a higher level of ground disturbance because it's going to be a ground up restoration. In our remnant areas, our oak woodlands, our wetlands, our prairie remnants, those things, uh, we used to be really conservative again. Uh, we kind of moved no equipment to then frozen ground. And now we're kind of somewhere in like the frozen, frozen ground or stable ground. We had some pretty dry conditions this winter at certain points as we try to take advantage of that. Uh, even more recently, we've kind of been moving towards like, if it's reasonable, maybe just kind of test it and let's see what happens. And, you know, we'll accept some level of disturbance. We try to limit it obviously significantly. And we've been really surprised at what resilience some of the ecosystems uh, have had in some of these areas where we've taken that approach, where we wouldn't have done it in previous years. Now we're doing it and kind of learning from our, our different approaches. So number three in that framework is the type of equipment. And again, each piece of equipment hand has its own kind of unique ground disturbance and a unique application. So in the last 15 years and more so recently, we, we've been pushing to larger and larger pieces of equipment. So uh, you know, the highest end of that spectrum, the most aggressive would be like feller bunchers, skidders, hydro axes, uh, land clearing, clearing equipment pretty much, which is pretty aggressive. We're also using obviously track skid loaders, which uh, Keith got into with various implements on those. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we've also been trying to eke things out with that. So we've been using mini skid steers with grapple buckets to help on marginal days or in tight locations. We've also been using mower decks on those to, uh, you know, to eat some more finer pieces of work out of as well. And in our opinion, each piece of equipment can be used optimally in certain situations when you kind of pair them all together to kind of hit uh, different fronts. So number four is the seasonality. So we used to look largely at kind of January and February as the maybe December sometimes is the core clearing season. And we typically still do our heaviest clearing during those, you know, core winter months. But now we've kind of expanded those bookends to include, you know, more into the fall and more into the spring uh, just to do different types of work. So there's an ebb and a flow, not only to each year, but also the seasonality. And if you pair certain types of work at different times of the year, the conditions uh, and, and their outcomes seem to be decent or optimal for various okay. things. Uh, so, for example, we will start brush mowing later in the summer, in the fall, uh, sorry, late summer, fall, something like that. And in the fall and in the spring, we'll actually do hand work when we can't be doing certain types of equipment. So that's kind of how we've expanded that season. Uh, number five on there is seize the day mentality. So staff have always kind of known and, and been able to seize the day. So if it's cold and it's frozen, they're obviously going to prioritize uh, more sensitive areas during those types of the seasons. When we don't have good conditions, then they'll prioritize equipment on lower quality sites and areas that need hand clearing. Uh, I work a lot with contracts and that's kind of my role here at the district and contracts are obviously more rigid because you've entered into a contract and you're bound to those terms. And so we've also morphed these over the years to kind of chase this changing weather. And so we have two contract types that we do. We have a lump sum uh, contract, which is basically like a clearing per acre, if you want to think of that on a fixed footprint. And then we also have a task order type contract, which is an hourly contract. So for these lump sum bids, about five years ago, we shifted from either an annual or uh, uh, maybe a buy a two year type of contracts with uh, set you know, increments that they needed to hit to now a three year timeline so that again, the contractors can manage their capacity in the various seasons, kind of adding in some buffer there so they can kind of seize the day throughout those three seasons and then do work when it's appropriate to do that type of work. Um, so we also have these large, uh, multiple large scale hourly task order contracts, which Troy's going to talk here and I stole it from him uh, and, and kind of modeled it in our own fashion. But um, so in these work orders, they're obviously built to be intentionally flexible. For us, we dictate who, what, when, where uh, to, again, seize the day. So we, we're using rubber track skid loaders there that have tree shears, disc mulchers, uh, a drum mulcher, grapple buckets, so we can kind of deploy those. We now have mini skids, again, to eke out those marginal days. We also have chainsaw brush cutter type work. And so we pre-plan this work, and then we train our contractors so that we can be, be doing the appropriate work when the appropriate conditions presents themselves. So we, we come up with a plan A, B, C, 
for them to, hey, if this is what happens, this is what we want you to do. If not, then do this. If not, then do that. And so we kind of always have these different backup plans, you know, to, to work with the season as opposed to trying to, to jam it into the wrong season. Um, so when you compare, kind of pair all these variables together, again, that decision matrix, like sensitivity, ground conditions, equipment, seasonality, seize the day for optimal work. Um, and then in terms of the preventative maintenance plan that we have, the last thing you want to do is clear these areas and then have to do it all over again. So we've tried to become significantly, significantly more disciplined in our approach before taking on new projects. So we want to ensure that what we did take on, that those are in good shape before ever moving forward onto something. We're not perfect, but obviously we're trying to be more disciplined about this. So in this system, we try to let fire in a, in a maintenance type situation do a majority of the work for us. And then and only then do we deploy our most expensive resources, which is the human resource, into those areas where fire did not top kill those invasive species. So units burned in the previous season, so our what we call our season is fall through spring, dictates what woody man maintenance we are going to be doing in the following spring. Uh, so we we do this with hand crews based on woody resprout control in the fall. So during portions of each fall, the woody, in space, woody invasive species that were not top killed by the fire stick out like a sore thumb. They're a, a bigger size class and they're green. And so then we can deploy these expensive human resources pin, with pinpoint accuracy into the areas that were not top killed by the fire. And so it significantly reduces the costs at which we're, we're having to do this and obviously the amount of herbicide that we're putting on the landscape as well. So we, we repeat this kind of fire first, then woody control strategy over and over again over many years. And we're hopeful that this will build a more resilient and more fire manageable landscape. And then when we take that saved time that it's, we're building this resilience and then we reinvest that back into new areas, but only once we have the capacity to do so. So this is basically our strategy. We try to keep an open mind continue to explore various things, even possibly even looking at other industries or many talking to many individuals. And like I said, stealing other forest preserves or other land managers ideas and then trying to implement them for ourselves. So thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, that was really, that was a great overview. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, Troy Showerman with Forest Preserves of Cook County is next. I'm sure you have a lot to share with us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks to Keith and Nick for covering the equipment and some of the contracting issues. As Nick said, he uh, we we work on similar, well, the DuPage and Cook have similar contracts. And uh, he also stole a lot of what I was going to say today. So he's uh, stealing a lot from me, but that's okay. My apologies. Uh, I'm taking notes so we can pivot. So I'll get into just a little bit about what we're doing at Cook County. Um, we have different groups that work for us, like like the other forest reserves, and not surprisingly, we have volunteer crews, we have conservation core crews, which are, you know, young people generally, all, or or people who are new to the industry, um, for more of a training position, and then we have six staff crews, and we have quite a bit of contract resources. So, like Nick, I manage our contract resources, but I'm also involved uh, district wide on planning. We've been very successful in getting funding uh, on a grant basis for winter projects, and that's really what we drive our uh, winter work towards, or what our grant work is to, sorry, what we drive our grant funding is to winter work, which is great, and it's been great how successful we are. Coming into this winter, we had about $4 million contracted for winter work, which is by far the most we'd ever had, and I imagine it's, you know, quite a bit in the region. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't had the winter that we all hoped. So a lot of what Nick already said, we're doing the same thing, trying to uh, pivot, take advantage. We did have a very dry winter, which was a blessing in disguise. If it would have been a wetter winter, we would have done significantly less work across the board with everyone. Um, so I would say that the things we've really tried to do is a lot of preparation. You know, we start planning winter work in June and it goes out throughout the entire summer into the fall. So we have these places to, to pivot to, like Nick was saying. So we kind of load up our contractors. We have a similar contract where we 
are these these projects we have set funding for like grants or mitigations or really big large scale projects we sort of tie up people's capacity with those projects and then we have the ability to move them into other things when conditions don't allow which is it's great for the contractors because they can keep their people working it's great for us because we're still getting work done what's not so great about it is it does pull away from our higher priority uh clearing sites so without getting into too much detail the district does have a pretty detailed uh prioritization that we use to work down through the priorities in terms of putting our funding where our, our highest priorities have been already set up and indicated. And we found that we do have success by linking these units together geographically. So we are getting less woody pressure and we can, ex, you know, really expand to include, you know, make burn units bigger, connect up burn breaks, things like that to, suppress the woody vegetation a lot of what nick was saying as well but then when we can't work in some of these higher quality areas because we don't have frozen ground we've really been moving to doing things like uh working along trails working at sites that um you know don't have the same ecological benefit but maybe have a wildlife benefit or um you know just a personal a public use benefit but that when on the follow-up side of things, all those acres that we cut that are not in our priorities sort of add to our summer woody follow-up. Um, so we don't really want to do that, but we are. And so the, the key for us is really having people ready to go. So when we do get those periods in the winter, whether it's dry or frozen, we never really know how many days we're gonna have. You know, we could have a bad winter and still get a lot cleared um, if, we, if we just have a short period of time that's frozen. So we are ready to deploy. When we did have frozen ground for about seven days in January, I think one day for sh for sure we had at least twelve machines out forestry mowing for us, um, maybe more if I really sat down and counted. So we had everybody ready to go, and that's the the planning aspect of this really can't be understated. Is that's the way we we can tackle winter is we try to just be as prepared as we possibly can be. Um, both on the prioritization side of things and then on the contracting side to just get everybody moving in the same direction. And then the other part of it is when we really started ramping up our contract resources as well as our crew and internal staff resources, we were working in a lot of the highest quality spots we owned. And these are mostly small. A lot of them are, um, you know, somewhat isolated and very sensitive and so there was a lot like nick was saying there was a lot of concern about ground disturbance and and rightly so and as we've moved away from these places and we're getting into these areas that have been degraded for longer or maybe have a different land use history with you know previous forest uh, reforestation or previous clearing in some areas we've been able to be a little bit more relaxed about ground conditions and then also as we make these units bigger and we're talking about instead of clearing five acres at a site, we're talking about clearing a hundred acres, the ability to absorb some of those impacts also is uh, mitigated. So instead, if we are getting a little bit of damage from a certain day or a certain week where maybe we didn't have the best ground conditions, we can still, the site overall is still benefiting from that because it's a much smaller, much smaller impact to the overall project. Uh, it also gives the contractors a lot more area to spread out. So like this, like this winter being the perfect case where we did have these dry conditions, or maybe you couldn't work around the edge of a wetland or along a stream or something like that, where the ground wasn't as stable. But if you're working more in an upland or a south facing slope, when we weren't getting rain for multiple days, they were able to run machines with really out, you know, with very limited impact. So we've been able to benefit from having those funding, being able to make really big units, and really being able to tie up a lot of contract resources. Um, so that's that's the way we've been trying to deal with it as best we can. I'll pass the baton. Thanks, Troy. That was a, that was also a really great overview. I know you have a lot going on. And I, I, I really enjoyed hearing about how kind of you're ready to deploy um, kind of at this broader scale when you have those seven days. So. Um, that that's that's a really good strategy. I, I really like that. And we may feel that from you. Um, get more of our people, you know, kind of, well, let's go. Um, so thank you. 
I'm not sure that Scott McCormick is um, with us right now. If you are, speak up. Okay, well then I'm going to um, uh, share my screen again and I'm going to bring up the, um, the talk again. Uh, let's see. Okay. Hopefully you guys are seeing now um, the wildlife services from uh, USDA for Eric Ness. Yes, looks great. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So Eric up. Eric is next. Thanks, Patty, and thank uh, you and Laura for inviting me today. So my name is Eric Ness. I'm with USDA APHIS Wildlife Services here in Illinois. Our mission is to provide federal leadership and expertise to resolve wildlife conflicts, to allow people and wildlife to coexist. And that brings us to the subject of today's talk, if you want to jump ahead, Patty, which is going to be deer. Um, so deer can have a pretty strong impact on the environment. Um, a lot of times you'll see that impact and then uh, the manager of that property will need to ask the question of how many deer are we dealing with? Um, and that's going to go over what we're going to talk about today. Um, luckily, there's a whole variety of methods that you can utilize to um, do wildlife surveys and get abundance estimates for an area. Um, there could probably be an entire college class over some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Um, so I'm just going to give a very brief overview of a few options some pros and cons, and then I have my contact information at the very end if there are any questions. Um, but abundance estimates, and this is deer-centric um, today, but this is really wildlife abundance estimates overall. Um, so what they can do, it's very good trend data. Um, and depending on what kind of method you're using, um, you can get some sex ratios, you can get an age structure, um, you can look at your fawn recruitment depending on what time frame you're running these surveys. But what can't they do? So they're not going to give a exact number of animals in an area. They're just not that accurate. Um, but then you're also not necessarily going to get your total habitat use because you might see the deer in the woody vegetation, but that's not to say they're always in the woody vegetation is kind of what that point is. So you're only getting that one snapshot that you're seeing the deer in that habitat at that time. It's not their overall picture. And you're also not going to get any home range estimates um, kind of with, alongside that last point, you're not going to know how far those deer are moving. So again, these are just snapshots in time. How many deer do we think we're dealing with is kind of the general gist of what we're looking at. Um, and then some notes. So the variety of methods, um, if done by the literature, for the most part, you're going to get an underestimate of the deer on the landscape. So you can say there's going to be at least this number of animals. Um, and then I mentioned it before, but different methodology is, is going to give you some different data um, to utilize for this. And each method has pros and cons, um, both for the habitat, depending on time frame, cost efficiency, as well as um, impact in surrounding areas and that sort of thing. Um, feel free to jump ahead, please, Patty. Um, so the first method and the most commonly used method around here is going to be aerial surveys via a helicopter. Um, helicopter surveys for deer are used across the country. They're very popular, and that's because they are kind of the leading standard of getting a pretty darn accurate abundance estimate for an area. Um, the problem is standard protocol for up in these parts, which really does impact your detection rate, is you require some snow on the ground, which this last winter was not great for. Um, so typically you're hoping for about four inches of snow on the ground. That gives you a really nice sight picture to pick up those brown deer as you're flying um, low and slow in the helicopter. That really does make them pop. And then you're also doing these in the winter just because then you don't have vegetation to contend with when trying to see. One of the notes with helicopter surveys, I mentioned it, but they're done across the U.S. So they're doing these helicopter surveys down in Texas where snow is not an option. Um, but it's also different habitat, you know, in our woodlands, it's still going to be very difficult to detect deer, even without snow in a helicopter, but it is possible. Just know that you can still do it, but it's going to drastically impact your detection rate. And so you're going to have to account for that after the fact. And there are some literature out there that will be able to tell you, okay, they've looked at, um, essentially putting deer decoys out in various areas, running helicopter survey, their detection rate was about 55% without snow. 
I can put that on and get an okay estimate on it. Uh, but there are some other methods you can utilize. Um, feel free to jump ahead for me, Patty. So um, other aerial deer counts, you could utilize fixed wing aircraft or drones. Um, these are kind of, I've, I've lumped them together because it's kind of a similar methodology where you're actually recording what you see and then you go back and you will review that footage. Um, you're also typically utilizing a FLIR, a forward looking infrared when you're doing these. And while that doesn't require the snow um, because you're using the infrared image to pick the deer up, it is still tricky and there are plenty of factors. We're doing some drone research ourselves and looking at even relative humidity to being able to pick up the deer has been a, a pretty significant factor. So while you can utilize it without snow, utilizing FLIR for these sorts of things, um, there are other factors you need to keep in mind when running them. Go ahead and jump ahead, Patty. Um, so you can do road-based surveys. So you're just driving around in a vehicle um, and you are doing either spotlight or FLIR from the roadways and you're doing a, a horizontal survey instead of a vertical survey. So you're looking across the landscape. Um, and these are effective. These have been one of the first ways that people went out. They're doing spotlight surveys to count deer. This has been around forever. Um, very well thought out in the literature if you want to look into it. Um, it's just, it takes a lot of time. Um, it's not fast. You're having to utilize, hopefully there's a roadway going through your core deer habitat. Um, but it is a possibility to utilize the road-based surveys with either a spotlight or a FLIR. Uh, go ahead and jump ahead, Patty. So a similar uh, concept to that is just doing pellet counts. So you are creating a transect within core deer habitat and you are walking and counting um, deer scat that you find along your transect. And you're doing, there's some modeling that kind of goes into it. How far away was the deer scat when I observed it for my transect, stuff like that. And again, you can get some pretty decent estimates with these, but it's making sure you have staff available in the time frame you want to survey these, um, do these pellet counts. And because they do take a lot of time, you're out running these transects. Go ahead and jump ahead. Um, so for these, what I've called real-time deer counts. So you're out surveying, and I guess pellet counts isn't necessarily a real-time deer count, but um, one of the things when you're running the either air or roadway um, sampling is going to be making sure you aren't double counting deer, deer are gonna be moving, so ensuring you aren't double counting them. Um, Knowing the area that you can survey, uh, you don't ever want to survey a, too large of an area where you aren't getting good, accurate counts of deer within that. Yes, you can see the deer 200 yards away, but really I should only be looking between 80 and 100. And then all those environmental variables I kind of touched on, but these can really impact your detection rate. So try and, and utilize under best conditions when you run these surveys. And then the last one I wanted to survey um, is camera surveys. So this is kind of the passive approach. Um, so this is setting up a grid, putting out cameras, and um, you're running these. It's about one camera per 100 or 150 acres. So do that math. If you have a very large area, that's the problem with these is they're not covering a huge ground. Um, but you're setting up a camera grid, and you can run some statistics behind the scenes to get a decent deer estimate off of that. Um, typically these require baiting is kind of the standard method, which would require a permit from the state. There are unbaited methods that have been popping up over the last decade. Um, this is essentially doing occupancy modeling where you have your camera grid, you have your detections, non-detections, and you're basing your abundance on that. And again, those are um, being pretty well looked at in the literature. And at the end here uh, is my contact info. I went very fast. Uh, each of these methods has pros and cons. Um, I do want to mention that um, a number of them, even spotlight surveys, spotlighting deer requires a permit from the state um, to make sure you follow all local, state, and federal rules and regulations. Um, do what you can to take away any guesses out of it, and then nothing's going to be 100% accurate. This is really good trend data, and it's going to get pretty close, but um, always keep that consideration when you're looking at these. And again, my contact info is up, so feel free to contact me with any more specific questions. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. That was a really great overview. And so our last panelist is Dave Casson with uh, Lake County Forest Preserve. Uh, thanks for being with us today, Dave. Yeah, my pleasure. I thought uh, Keith, Nick, and Troy all kind of summed up what thoughts I had on it. 
I think staying flexible and logistically mobile are the the two most important things with the the varying winters that we've been having lately. A little different with public sector versus private companies in that you know we don't have contract deadlines and things like that that we necessarily have to worry about when we're doing in-house work. Um, but there's always something that we can keep the pecans going on. We've had uh, for several hundred acres that are still in agriculture that have old tree lines running through them. So even if we have wet winter weather with no snow cover, uh, we can mow out those old tree lines and uh, know that the ground's going to get plowed and planted into corn anyways. So I will keep this absolutely brief. Again, I think Keith, Troy, and Nick did a great job. And that way we can preserve 15 minutes for a little Q&A here too. So. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, so um, I... Don't think we're necessarily going to have time for um, uh, kind of breakout sessions, which is kind of what I thought we might be able to do. But I am really happy with all of the information that everybody shared. So I actually have a question for Eric. Um, and if you have other questions that you'd like to um, have our panelists ask, if you could drop them in the chat, um, maybe we can um, get to them. Uh, kind of one by one. Um, so, Eric, I think one of the big challenges for us this winter certainly was um, the number of days or lack of the number of days that we had to do um, our aerial deer counts. And that is, you know, our standard method um, is to do aerial surveys in a helicopter. Um, we've tried some of the drone surveys with the FLIR. Um, haven't necessarily aligned very well with what we think the helicopter surveys are going to give us. And so that's kind of my question um, for you is what are your thoughts about um, having to change methods kind of midstream uh, as we all are probably going to have to do, especially moving into the future? How do we account for the error in detection rate in particular that we're going to face? as we start changing up our method? Yeah, it's a very good question. So you're essentially taking one trend set of data and then you're having to account for external variables in that trend data. And that's really hard to account for. Um, overall, I would say um, looking at your impact, so seeing how those trends in your population are impacting the what you're seeing on the ground. So. Yes, your detection rate is showing that there's less deer in an area, but um, you're also seeing less impact or you're seeing more impact. So you really need to look at that site in particular. Um, so being able to connect those two, I think, will be the most important ways um, when adjusting for these types of things is seeing the deer impact and then being able to try and make sense of that trend data and see what's going on. And there's plenty of literature that'll kind of help with some of these things, like I mentioned, deer estimates are are just covered in literature so um look at that when you're having to adjust for some of these kind of things for your detection rate and and trying to fine tune your abundance estimates okay great i i appreciate that that's that's really good to keep that in mind is kind of especially that you know the impact as well as the the counts that you you're getting um and uh Dave, I had a question for you um, in particular, uh, just because I'm, of course, familiar with the work. And that is, um, we were able to really quickly uh, change gears with the in-house crews um, from kind of, you know, traditional winter work to burning. And maybe uh, that's a good thing to kind of talk about um, and let people know how nimble you have to be to be able to kind of change gears uh, mid-season like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like one of the things I always try to do is be logistically ready for anything, as other people have touched on. Uh, we keep our burn rigs ready to go. We store them in heated garages so that we could be plowing snow one day and then two days later be burning like we did a month ago or whatever it was. Um, always have the projects planned. Um, I got the spreadsheet. I just keep it on my desk. Ooh, it disappears. But it's got yellow, orange, and red, and that's ground conditions of places we can mow. So those frozen ground days that we do get, uh, we're mobilizing to some of the red square spots to get those mowed. One other thing that I was going to point out that's very important is we kind of shifted some of our contractual dollars 
to doing the follow-up herbicide 3A spraying in June so that it doesn't impact what full-time staff has to do. So if we get that opportunity to go mow that 100-acre field that's overgrown, I don't necessarily have to take my guys off of something in June. The contractors can go do the follow-up herbicide, which is serving us very well up here in Lake County. So. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, yeah. And uh, Troy, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how kind of your your ecologists or the other people who are working on site, how they're able to um, kind of change gears pretty quickly, call upon a contractor to do X, Y, or Z, maybe a little bit on the fly. How does that actually work in your organization? Yeah, so to start with going into the winter, we'll have a, a bunch of places uh, that are sort of queued up. Um, so contractor wise, we issue work orders. And so we, like I said, we have ones that'll be kind of locked into those higher quality spots when we want frozen ground. And then me and my team work with our, a bunch of our staff to identify places, but we're identifying these places in ideally like August, September. So places they can work in November, December, January, if we do get these periods of time that are not frozen ground. And so it's, it's not always easy. And like example, this winter, I felt really good in October. Like I felt we had lined up a bunch of work and we had these great projects that were going to be worthwhile, even if they were not in our top priorities and we burned through them in December. So, and it was like a mad scramble. So I mean, we were, we'll still able to come up with someone. I mean, it is great having a bunch of staff here that are really keyed into the properties, you know, having ecology staff, having wildlife biologists, um, really they can help come up with places where we can accept a lot of these things. But again, it, it really comes back to the amount of planning. Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention earlier that's sort of like around this is we are looking now at, we've had a couple of units this winter that where we worked like half of it under frozen ground and half it under non-frozen ground. And you can go out there right now and you can tell the difference of where, like where they did both. So we're going to, we're actually going to set up some monitoring plots. Our, our ecology team is going to do that. Um, unfortunately we won't really have any results for several years, but I would encourage if anybody else who has the ability to do that, it would be great if we could combine forces and just to get as many data points to see if there actually is a difference. Cause depending on everyone has a different opinion on, uh, how things end up when you mow or you, you take this heavy equipment into places without frozen ground. I think everyone's in agreement of how it looks with frozen ground. Um, so we're going to really see if there is, if there ends up being any difference in the plant community three years from now. Uh, so just wanted to point that out. I think that's a great idea. And I hope we'll figure out a venue in three years for you guys to share that, um, come back together and, um, maybe some other people are also doing that kind of monitoring because I think it is really important. Um, so there uh, was a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, one of the questions I think is really um, from Sarah Long for public sector and nonprofit managers. How have you been communicating with grantors and adapting work due to unexpected weather conditions? To accomplish the deliverables when you have a grant time frame. Um, I know, Troy, you talked a bit about um, granting. I think maybe, Nick, you also have some grants? Yeah. Uh, so we, we do have a grant administrator, Michelle, and she does a great job communicating uh, these concerns. It's an ongoing, I, I, it's very, I don't know in, I've been here for 10 years. We've had grant projects every winter and I don't know, maybe like once we finished on time and it's not because of any fault of anybody, really. It's just the weather and the, and the tight time frames that we have for grants. I mean, grants are great to get the money, but they, they do, you know, when I was talking about prioritizing and where we go with our money, the grants often suck up the priorities because I mean, ideally it's in a, it's the, they, they combine, but they don't always combine perfectly. And we always force those things first. They're always our priority because we always have some sort of time frame to, to get the work done versus spending our own dollars. We basically have eternity to get Buckthorn cleared. Right. I mean, Forest Serve district of Cook County is not going anywhere. So, um, it, it's an, it's kind of an, for the most part, it's been really not, not an issue. We've been able to get extensions. Um, 
we try to make sure we're showing progress that, you know, we're not, it's not just like, Oh, we got nothing done because it was, it was a mess. We're, we're trying to do something. Um, and we've been able to sort of kick the can down the road with extensions pretty successfully. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I know that that has been kind of a big focus for us too. Um, and being able to, to bring in those deliverables when there is a grant in place and it does tend to form the priority. Like when we do have frozen ground or maybe we're sometimes starting to think about, well, if we're gonna have a grant funded project, maybe let's think about doing it on higher ground where having frozen conditions may be less of an important factor. Um, so I think having to be nimble in either way and taking advantage of uh, contract extensions or, you know, grant extensions if you need to. Yeah, that's a good point. We've, we've gotten a little bit better too on, on our ask of not so much the footprint, but like instead of going for a hundred acres, maybe we're going to go for 50 because it's just going to be more likely we're going to get that done. Right. Uh, so we've done a better job at being more realistic about what we can, what we can do. Right. Great. Thank you. And um, Nick, anything else to add to that? I would say we're really similar. Um, the only thing I would add is that when we're going after grants that we have been um, putting in guardrails for ourselves to make sure that when we go after a grant, it's very in line with what we already want to accomplish. And so, yes, grants are a high priority. They have timelines, but it's also our priority. So then we want to prioritize our priorities, obviously. So that helps us get closer to that finish line, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there's also a question about how do some of the land managers foresee individual contract creation and specification changing for upcoming winters? Um, and I I have to say, uh, I can answer a little bit for um, Lake County. Um, and for Lake County, we're thinking about um, and exploring and trying to figure out what those specifications are gonna be. Um, and we're moving away from, I think, we're at least planning on moving away from um, kind of the individual contracts to more the, the kind of work order contracts that both Troy and Nick have been talking about um, because uh, we think that that will allow us to become more nimble. Um, and, and I think that's probably a good model for us, but if there are other land managers who have a different perspective, um, I think that's going to be interesting. Yeah, adaptive management, as you were saying, Patty, we've had conversations going to where you have kind of a smorgasbord of activities, so it doesn't really matter if it's raining, snowing, frozen, thawed, growing season. There's always something on that that we can get something accomplished through, and it just allows us the flexibility to to keep it going as well, rather than extending contracts year over year, because we can't get that one task done in a growing season. Yeah, it, it is it, it is really um, kind of a challenge. And I, I, I one of the things, uh, Nick, that you said that I think is um, really important, and I, I really appreciate the perspective, and that is, you know, that you still feel like you're able to really keep with your priority areas. Um, and, and I'm I'm curious, is it just because you just really focus on that and kind of to the exclusion of other things or um, are you just kind of being less opportunistic in the work that you're doing on any given day? I would put a big asterisk on try, uh, you know, trying to prioritize things, but Again, stealing ideas from Cook County. I really love their resource prioritization plan. And so we don't have a resource prioritization plan, but I at least try to follow the concepts that they have outlined within that of basically looking at landscape scale, breaking down the puzzle pieces of that. So we use burn units to break down the puzzle pieces of let's call it a preserve or a complex of preserves and then prioritizing you know, based on core of those areas and then outlining, um, you know, basically at least for a season, but in my head, I kind of have multiple seasons in my head of how do I connect 
a project we did three or four years ago with a project that I'm doing now. And then there's kind of this, you know, unrestored space in between. How do I make that happen? And then I try to look at unique ways to fund it. So we have a couple different weird ways that maybe other forest preserves don't. So uh, we have uh, some landfill funds that sometimes will pay for certain things if it's connected to the, the landfill footprint. We have um, a bunch of spaces that were impacted through development, and we've been able to create a contract structure for that called impacted sites. And so I've been able to use that. And so I, it makes it really confusing on the funding front because some of those funds are annual funds, some are five-year funds, some are infinite funds. And, and then you divide it up between six contractors on that task order contract and tracking the budget on that becomes incredibly complex. But it's basically stitching together those things. And then when you see a grant opportunity come, it's not like, oh, what can we do? It's like, here's what we have to do. Does it fit that particular thing? If it doesn't kick it out, get rid of it. Great, thank you. Patty? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, Steve Byers with Friends of Hackmatack. Um, I appreciate that the Forest Preserve District, the Conservation District have a, a lot of flexibility with regard to where they can operate over the course of the winter or throughout the season uh, on lands that are perhaps not as high quality as others. So there is flexibility, but for smaller groups like the Friends of Hackmatack, you know, we rely on grant funding, so we are restricted. Uh, and we found that this winter we had to actually revise our contract and we subsequently hired uh, Keith Gray and Integrated Lakes Management because they had a machine that was designed to operate in wet ground. And of course we had no frozen ground to speak of this winter. So my suggestion was, is it possible for this group or Chicago Wilderness to to reach out to contractors and compile a list of those contractors that have machines that are capable of operating in less than optimal conditions, either wide track vehicles or the big machine that Keith showed. That's what we have operating on one of our sites right now. That's a really um, great idea, at least to have, and there are other groups that have kind of a, I think there's a group out West and then another one in Australia that has um, kind of a, a list of the types of machines and the work that they can do, their ground pressure, et cetera. So um, I think that that is a, a really, really good suggestion, Steve. Um, and I know we're kind of running out of time, but I did want to follow up with Keith and give him an opportunity to just give us his perspective on um, kind of the, the individual seasonal type of contract work versus the work order contract work and, and how, you know, how a group like ILM um, or any other contractor is kind of able to try and be nimble um, when they've got a lot of different um, clients that are all kind of battling the same circumstances. Oh boy, and that well, <laughs> I that's a tough one, Patty. And and you and I have spoke about you know this and and how can we be of the greatest value to our clients? Um, and 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 I think certainly staffing with with a lot of different talents and and being equipped with a lot of different machines goes a long long way toward that. But I think as everybody alluded to, flexibility within the contract itself that allows for there to be a shift when, when things don't appear to be going the way they need to be going, I think is incredibly invaluable. So, you know, when I look at an acre or five acres or 10 acres um, and there's frozen ground, that's one price. And if we look at no frozen ground and it's gotta be done by hand and, and the material burnt or chipped or left in place, you know, that's another price. And, and I think just, I'm just winging it here, but, you know, maybe if you were to, to request quotes from services that said, okay, for this type of activity, what is your, your rate? Or, or if you use this method, what would that be? And if you use that method, what would it be? And then have those options as the season unfolds might um, streamline a little bit, right? Because sometimes, and I understand your guys' challenge, you know, going back and getting change orders sometimes is an onerous process, you know, within your organization. So, to maybe short circuit that by by anticipating what may happen 
and having options already in place before the season starts um, can help everybody. I think that would be really, really helpful. That's a great perspective, Keith. Thanks so much. Um, so we are um, kind of- Just real quick, Patty, if I could. Yeah, I please. Think one big challenge for Keith and private sector contractors would be having flexibility. I mean, obviously everybody in the private side likes to keep their machines running all the time, booked. So if you're booking jobs, but then you have a contract that requires flexibility, I think the districts and agencies need to allow flexibility to the private contractors too, so that they can work it into their other workloads that they might have. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Thank you. Um, if there's, does anybody have a burning question or comment that they really feel like they need answered right this second? Okay. Well, I would like to thank all of the panelists for joining us today. I think this was absolutely a great conversation. Um, I know I learned a lot. I took a lot of notes and, uh, hopefully that will help us here in Lake County to um, be a little bit more nimble. And I hope that other people uh, found it valuable as well. So I appreciate everybody spending some time with us today and sharing their perspective. Thank you. Thank you to Patty for setting this up and all of our panelists. It was a great discussion. Um, I am happy to work on any cafe topics with anyone who would like to continue these conversations. Um, please reach out to me or complete the form with your idea that's listed on our website. Um, but I think these, these are the ways that we can kind of advance this work around the region and, and learn from each other. So thank you everyone for your time today. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Great day. Bye everybody. Um, the webinar will thank be recorded you. and placed on our website along with um, any of the slides that were shared. So. Great.